Commission's website once um, uh, once the meeting concludes, so that uh, anybody who wants to uh, you know take a look at some part or all of the meeting can uh, can do so uh, at any time. Um, there will also, of course, be um, be formal you know minutes of the meeting um, uh, uh, will be uh, will be posted uh, once they are uh, once they are complete. Um, before we begin the meeting, or I should say, before we go into um, any sort of discussions, we're going to take a roll call of all the commission members. And um, and so when I when I do read out your name, please indicate your presence and uh, and also indicate if there's anybody else present in the room uh, with you during the uh, during the meeting. Um, let's see. Oh. So, and then one final, um, one final note, and and I, I sort of feel feel bad about this because I've always uh, liked public comment, and I've always found it really valuable when I was on a school board, and I think it's been valuable uh, in these meetings too. But as we're sort of getting into um, uh, remote meetings, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna start this one without uh, without. Uh, public comment during the meeting. Uh, if you do want to, if if any of the members of the public want to, um, uh, you know, want to provide us with uh, public comment, please do so by emailing the um, uh, School Funding Commission at schoolfunding.commission at unh.edu. And uh, that email address is checked, and we can certainly collect those and get that information out to members of the commission. Hopefully, as um, as these things start to run a little more smoothly, we'll be able to uh, to uh, take live uh, uh, public uh, public comment. Um, but uh, uh, one step at a time here. So um, so with that, I'm going to swing uh, swing around and um, and. Uh, and take roll call of the commission members. I'll start with myself, Dave Luno, and uh, there is nobody here in the room uh, with me. So uh, uh, next, uh, let's see, do we have Mel? Has Mel joined up yet? No. No. He is not. He is not joined up yet. Okay. Um, Rick Ladd. Yes, I am here with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Khan. Here in Keene, nobody present. All right, Senator Morgan. I saw him there. Yeah, he's there. We're not getting audio from you, John. John? Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm here in Brentwood, and my uh, four year old William Michael is with me. All right, awesome. So uh, he can help inform the discussion. <laughs> So, um, Bill Ardinger. Hi, I'm here in Concord, New Hampshire at my home and no one else is with me in my home office. <laughs> okay. Um, Jane Bergeron. I am here in Litchfield with my dog. All right. <laughs> Kareen Cascaden. I'm here in Berlin with no one. Awesome. David Ryan. Just me in the room here at 30 Linden Street in Exeter. Fantastic. John Beardmore. We have John on yet? No, he's he was having some trouble as well. Okay. Um, Iris Estabrook. Here, home alone. Thanks, Iris. Uh, Barbara Tremblay. Hi, I'm Keen. I'm alone in this room, yep. All righty. Um, Chris Dwyer. Uh, yes, alone here in Portsmouth. Okay, and uh, Susan Huard. Uh, I'm alone except for a wandering cat in Hookset. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, Val Zanchuk? Uh, alone in my office in Jaffrey. All righty. And um, Mary Heath? Oh, Microphone. we're not getting audio, Mary. Still not getting. Can okay, you, I'm here. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Hello. Great to see you. And I see Mel Myler has uh, come aboard. Uh, Mel, yes, I'm here in yes, I'm here in Contoocook, New Hampshire, in my home office. All right, anybody with you? No, ma'am. No, sir. Okay. 
And uh, has anybody else joined since we uh, started the yeah, I'm... Oh, John Beardmore is almost in. Let's give John a second. Is, is um, what's John, is he clear in the weight room or? We uh, need to unmute. Yeah, he should be. We need to unmute John. I don't know why we're, we can, um, can we unmute John? Yeah, I was clicking the button and nothing was happening, so. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, um, John is is. Uh, I don't know if John can hear us either. So. <laughs> he just he just sent me an email and he says his his internet connection may not be totally stable. Okay. Oh, I. Somebody's getting a phone call. Yeah. Hey, it's me. <laughs> well, we're going to have to bear with these things from remote meetings, though. So. All right. Well, um, we're going to have to find out from John, you know, uh, well, We'll, we'll catch up with him when, when he's able to get a uh, stable um, connection. So uh, uh, with that, um, um, welcome everybody. Hey, welcome Dave, you, Dave, you, Dave, you missed me. Oh, Dick Ames, how did we miss you? I think I dropped off for a moment. Okay. So I'm back on. All right. Sick I'm, Ames. Here, I'm here and no, no one else is in the room. All right, fantastic. Thanks, did I miss anybody else? All right, so so oh, and there's there's I John. I speak Beardmore. Yep. It, can, John, you. can you unmute yourself? Yeah, back in business. All right, fantastic. And uh, so you're here. And uh, anybody? We're supposed to find out if there's anybody in the room with you. Nope. All right, terrific. So um, so we're full full um, strength here, and um, and we got a lot to uh, do today. So I'll keep some uh, opening remarks brief. But um, but uh, I want to welcome everybody back. Um, it's um, it's uh, uh, been obviously a little frustrating over the last uh, uh, almost two months uh, since uh, since we last met, and um, and we certainly wanted to meet uh, uh, many times prior to um, to May fourth. But uh, uh, but uh, you know, it turns out. Um, you know, some of this technology isn't the easiest thing to um, to uh, uh, have work properly and, and, and get right, but I think we're getting better at it, and, uh, and I'm glad we're able to move forward um, uh, today. Um, uh, I, before we get started with um, uh, with the agenda, uh, I just thought maybe we'd we'd sort of go around the room real quick and give everybody. Uh, you know, uh, 10 seconds to sort of uh, say hi and and uh, and uh, what you've been doing and how you're doing and um, um, and uh, and I'll I'll get started with this that uh, that uh, um, uh, everybody in in the Luno family has been well. Uh, our kids are not in Boston at the moment. They're they're back around here. Uh, we had some. Uh, uh, fun news in our family. My son got uh, got engaged to his longtime girlfriend um, a few weeks ago, so um, uh, so we're really excited about that. And it's nice to have a um, piece of good news uh, come into our lives during this time. Um, and um, and as we uh, get into the agenda, we'll be talking about the things that have been moving forward with the school funding commission. So it hasn't been idle on this end. So um, so. Uh, uh, I don't know who wants to take it next, Mel. Got on mute, Mel. Mel, we can't hear you. I'm there doing just fine. I'm just doing just fine, um, and um, working hard and uh, 
trying to stay ahead of everything. So uh, it's been it's been very busy. Great, uh, Dick. Sure. Um, not idle at this end. Doing well with the family, and um, uh, the not idle part relates both to this uh, this commission and the screening committee in particular. Not, several have been working hard on that some harder than me. And then uh, the uh, Ways and Means Committee has also been active on uh, the uh, impossible to predict revenue issue. Right, right. Great, thanks, Dick. Uh, Rick. Oh, hi, yep, uh, all's well here in Haverhill. I'm enjoying the gardening now. Uh, all the kids <laughs> are on online instruction, successfully doing so, and I've enjoyed working with you on the other subcommittees. Yep, great, great, thanks, Rick. Jay. Got to unmute, Jay. Keen's doing well, uh, David. I started the day at eight o'clock uh, with a town hall meeting that uh, we're doing every Monday. Uh, yeah, constituent issues are, are a big chunk mm -hmm. of uh, effort, but, uh, uh, and then looking forward to uh, another fiscal committee meeting on Friday, pretty loaded agenda there. and. Uh, yeah, it's been good uh, working with you over the last couple of weeks. I think uh, our conversations and progress, uh, while it's hard to see uh, that yet, uh, I think we can get out of the starting gate pretty quick and I'm looking forward to it. Great, thanks, thanks Jay. John, Morgan. Uh, doing well, we're uh, keeping very, very busy with the three little guys and uh, making sure that they stay on top of uh, their homeschooling and we're trying to be right there with them uh, and and uh, really thrilled to be in SAU 16 under the uh, incredible leadership of Dr. Ryan. Terrific. Is it homeschooling or schooling from home? Yeah, schooling from home. I'll <laughs> let the technicalities go to, go to uh, the other folks, but we're, uh, we are doing school at home. Thanks, John. Um, uh, let's see, Bill. Yes, thank you. We, we are, knock on wood, all doing healthy and safe here at, in Concord. And uh, I've been working on the stakeholder advisory board process for um, dealing with the, the COVID crisis, which has taken a lot of time. But I'm glad this commission is started up again. And thanks for all the work that you have done with the team, with Mel and with Jay and others to get this up and running. Thanks, Bill, thanks. It's a team effort, that's for sure. Uh, Jane. All well in Litchfield, we're all <laughs> healthy. Um, and in regards to special education, it's been um, a very, very challenging time for um, special educators and special ed administrators during their remote learning. So we've been very busy. Great, great. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Kareen. You there, Kareen? Yep. Okay. okay. Unmute. Had to unmute. Yep. Um, things are good in Berlin. No reported cases of COVID-19. So nobody come visit. That's the first direction. <laughs> um, I've been busy because I'm finishing out a contract in Littleton in June. Um, and we're trying to, you know, operate the way you would when schools are open because you still have all the same activities and things you need to deal with. So graduation is definitely a big one. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been doing remote instruction, uh, well, this morning with a six-year-old grandson and tomorrow with both of my granddaughters because I have a son and two daughter-in-laws that work in healthcare uh, in hospitals and a son that works in federal, um, the federal institution. So they're all, they all need childcare. So in between mm -hmm. working, um, I've been trying to do that as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad to come, I'm glad this is up and running. I, th I like the format so far and I <clears> like <throat> the, the graphs. I, you know, I'm a visual person, so I like to see things um, so that I can have a roadmap of what, what our job is. So mm -hmm. hopefully I can contribute. Great, thanks, Kareen. Um, David Ryan from the beach. Trying to keep uh, John's kids active in their <laughs> home. Um, we pivoted to 5,000 students learning from home with uh, 
Wow. 2,000 employees still on the payroll, making sure that that all happens. Uh, just like Corinne, it, everything, it doesn't stop. It actually got a lot harder and our time became even, um, we have less time to do things because there's so much more to do when you move your entire SAU to a remote platform. Right. Uh, I don't recommend it for anybody in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're looking at what are we doing this summer for intervention, as well as a return to school in the fall. Uh, so we have a lot of work we're doing. Personally, we're great. My wife's home, my uh, college kids home, my two high schoolers are all working on uh, learning from home. And uh, the worst thing I did two weeks ago was buy a basketball hoop because all they want to do is play two on two every day. And my body just can't take it anymore. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, thanks Dave. Um, John Beardmore. Hey everybody, um, good to see you all. <clears throat> I've been uh, working from home in Hopkinton since March 10th. Um, as many of you know, I work in municipal finance, so it's been a super interesting and volatile couple months. So I've probably never worked harder and longer hours um, while my two uh, children, first grade and uh, fifth grade try to do the, the distance learning thing, which so far has gone uh, really well in Hopkinton, thanks to some really good teachers. So good to see you all. Great to hear, John. Thanks. Um, Iris. Uh, things are good here, given the situation. <laughs> Everyone is well, thank goodness, and employed, the younger generation. Uh, we miss those we can't see because we can't fly, but we've been Zooming a lot. And as most people, reconnecting with folks we haven't talked to in a while, which is one nice thing. Looking forward to getting back to work on this. Great, awesome, thanks, Iris. Barbara. Hi, all. Uh, just have been busy, like many of you have. I serve on a lot of a number of boards and um, at the college and in the community. I uh, concern for our kids uh, that are graduating. Uh, right now I'm on two committees looking at scholarships for those students and how we're going to give those. Um, so staying very busy doing lots of Zoom meetings. Um, we have two sons and two daughter-in-laws who are doctors. So we check in with them frequently, mm -hmm. very concerned for all four of them, but they're doing well and uh, uh, we're proud of them for providing the service they're doing. Um, I, I'm excited to get us all going again on school funding. Obviously, <laughs> this is called to the forefront uh, issues for many of our districts. So very interested and um, glad to see you all and work with you all again. Great. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Chris. Yeah, I've actually been busier than usual. I ended up with the assignment from the U.S. Department of Ed to facilitate a weekly COVID related briefings for the centers that deal with policy and research that are working with states and schools. So we've been addressing like we, you know, the CARES Act, obviously, um, graduation attendance requirements, continuity of learning, professional development. So every week we've been taking a different topic. People are now switching into some scenario planning for the opening of school and whether or not, as in a number of states, people are considering that they won't be going back to five-day-a-week schooling, but they'll do some form of blended work. So um, doing one of those every week and preparing for it and then following up has kind of kept me pretty busy. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, Susan. Well, I flunked retirement. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. So as of Monday, I started my new full-time job uh, as the interim chancellor for the community college system. Uh, uh, for the next two weeks, uh, Ross Gattel and I are a tag team. And after that, he's going to abandon me to become the president of Bryant University. Right. Uh, needless to say, it's been a very exciting week uh, trying to figure out how and when we can open the colleges up. We have the immediate problem of a lot of our students who are in technical programs needing to complete their lab work so that they can be certified and go out and be electricians and automotive technicians 
and all sorts of wonderful things. So. That's great. That's great, Susan. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing that. And thanks for, uh, for flunking retirement. So. <laughs> uh, Val. So everyone at home is, is good. Uh, we've been working here at Graphicast since day one, uh, never shut down. And uh, we're finding um, our backlog is the highest it's ever been. 70% wow. uh, of our customers are in the medical equipment business. So they are trying to get us to expedite more and more. And our non-medical uh, customers are pushing things out. <laughs> so we're seeing the, the push and pull of the marketplace. But we have... Uh, some of our customers are directly involved with COVID diagnostic equipment, so they're begging for parts as quickly as we can get them to them. So we're uh, interestingly in, you know, involved uh, behind the scenes and trying to keep everybody healthy. That's great. Thanks for your service on that, Val. So, um, Mary. There. Um, pretty busy here in Manchester. Um, I'm really happy to announce the Finance Committee had its first executive session last week, so that was pretty cool. Um, the homeless situation in Manchester is tough. Um, the COVID-19 um, virus has hit our city pretty hard, and um, the homeless population is, um, it just seems like it's growing by leaps and bounds, so <laughs> that, that's a challenge for our city. Um, I've been attending a lot of the NCSL sessions on Zoom um, about the CARES Act funding. So that's been pretty interesting. And then of course, we're working on our um, school charter commission um, input and our school budget, as well as beginning the county budget process. So busy, busy, busy. It is. Mary, um, thanks very much. Um, did I, oh, and let me, uh, let me swing it around to Jordan and Terry. How are you guys doing? Doing doing pretty well, uh, like a lot of folks. You know, staying busy as ever. Uh, had to postpone my wedding from uh, from this year oh. to next year, so that is definitely uh, a bummer. But uh, just more time to, to make it even better. So great, great. And and Carrie, how are you doing? I am in the last month of my PhD. Yay! <laughs> Wonderful. Good and stressful time. I, you'll be seeing a little less of me for a month. Um, Bruce, Bruce is, uh, will be doing quite a bit of reading of my writing here in a little bit. Oh well, well, best of luck with with all right. of that. I'm sure that's very stressful. Jennifer, how are you doing? Doing good here in Concord. I've been seeing a lot of uh, Representative Heath on the NCSL uh, forums that are taking place, so that's always fun. Um, the four dogs are very much enjoying our current normal, uh, <laughs> so there's some silver lining. Yeah. Um, really glad to see our legislative committees getting back underway um, with with finance and then um, municipal, municipal and county this week, and I'm sure there's going to be more to come. So we're pretty excited. Great, great. And Bruce, how are you doing? Doing well, Dave. Thanks. Like others, I'm finding that I'm working <clears throat> sort of twice as hard for half the level of productivity. Um, certain kind of degree of frustration with this. But we've been sheltered in at my house now for eight plus weeks, I guess. I've got some family members here from Boston who are with us for the duration. Um, and uh, this work has obviously kept me quite occupied as well as some other Carsey projects that I'm, that I'm engaged with right now. Just one comment that I'll make, I'll note, um, because of its personal meaning to me and perhaps others on this call, uh, today marks 50 years ago that uh, the Kent State um, incident, the massacre, as, as it was called, occurred. And I was a young college student uh, going to college about 90 miles away from Kent State. My brother was a special operations um, serviceman in Vietnam at the time, and I was at home leading the demonstrations against the war. So that was my family uh, 50 years ago this week, and it was a, it was a bittersweet, poignant time for our country. And um, it reminds me that our country has faced some really huge challenges in the past and has always um, gotten through it and, and I think been better for it. I think that's gonna happen this time too. <clears throat> 
Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Bruce. So, um, let's see. I'm just checking uh, chat right now, and I see that uh, that Jay sort of has his hand up. Did you want to? Um, Thanks, David. I, yes. I I wanted to make sure that I got this right, uh, Superintendent Ryan uh, and Cascaden. We have uh, Teacher Appreciation Day a week is uh, starting today, right? That's correct. Well, I sure want to, you know, do the echo on your shout out uh, to uh, all the educators that have made the, the transitions and kept kids and parents as busy as they have. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a very busy time for them and their families. And uh, thank gosh uh, that, that folks are, uh, we're so capable and committed to, uh, to making the transition as quickly as they did. Thank you both. Right. And all your teachers. Yeah. And Jane, Cheers. all of yours too. Cheers to that. That's for sure. Um, right. We hear stories all over about uh, uh, what what teachers are doing to um, uh, work with their their kids, and I really think it's uh, it's had a uh, and and will have a dramatic effect on 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 public education. But uh, but I think uh, certainly here in New Hampshire. It's, um, it's it's seen a lot of people really really step up to the challenge and uh, and uh, just do an extraordinary job. So so thanks to all of our teachers and administrators uh, for their hard work and effort. Um, so I uh, wanted to swing it over to Jordan to sort of take us through a little bit of a tech check, but it sounds like people are um, are getting the getting the hang of it. So um, Jordan, did you want to make a couple of comments on this? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, just so everybody knows, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, we're not really using much in terms of the, the chat panel. Um, we're just kind of speaking, uh, this is being recorded. Uh, please mute yourselves, uh, when you're not speaking to reduce any kind of feedback issues. Uh, feel free to raise your hand, uh, if you'd like to kind of get yourself, uh, in the, in the queue to say something if you're waiting for other folks to finish. Um, you can do that by, uh, I believe, clicking on your your name and then clicking the, the raised hand function. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll just try to do our best to to work with the new new technology and uh, we're all we're all learning the wonders of Zoom here. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Does anybody have any questions for Jordan? on this. So um, I, I'm not hearing any, but I'd, I'd just like to make one comment because because um, I know on a lot of other Zoom meetings that I've been on, there's lots of chat going on and, and whether it's chat to everybody or chat to one on one. And I really want to try to avoid I mean, if you want to get my attention to to um, to to call on you or something fine, if you want to send me a, um, a, a direct chat, but I don't want to get into any sort of um, uh, side discussions on on any sort of material uh, ish, issue at all. So um, so let's uh, uh, let's keep the chat part down. And and if you want to um, uh, you know because I think that's a fairly manageable thing with with um, what do we got twenty one uh, on here that um, that if you want to want to get my attention well you get everybody's attention by waving your hand and if you want to do it that way that's fine too. It may even be quicker than um, than seeing it uh, on the participant list. So so uh, so that'd be fine. Or just unmute and and break in. That's another way to do it too. Uh, uh, we're obviously going to have to find what ways work best for us. Um, with that, I think it's a good segue over to Bruce to talk about um, how our group agreements uh, adapt to uh, uh, the remote technology. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so I'm going to remind everybody of the group agreements that the Commission uh, developed and agreed to uh, at the beginning of our process. Those still stand. Those are important. Maybe the, the first couple, especially being open minded to each other's ideas, listening first um, uh, and taking into consideration what other people have to say. It's OK to disagree, but don't personalize it. We focus on the ideas, not the person. Um, 
let's assume that there'll be conflict and disagreement within this, within our deliberations, and we'll accept working through conflict um, as a catalyst for learning. It's okay to put sensitive issues like uh, race or ethnicity and class on the table in a group that's talking about issues of equity and disparity, those are going to come up. Um, be purposeful and to the point, try to be concise, and make sure that what you're uh, contributing is, is uh, relevant and to the point at hand. Um, take risks, be raggedy, make mistakes, that's all fine, that's the way we uh, learn from each other and then let go, and we all share uh, responsibility for, uh, for productive uh, process here within the commission. In addition, um, I wanted to share several that we in, at the Carsey School and New Hampshire Listens now use with our online work. Um, we're trying to help people to understand ways to have constructive and respectful civil conversations um, online as well. Again, listening to each other, being patient around technology. Um, all of us, I think, are learning something about patience um, in this experience, in this process. Uh, Use hand signals if you can't use the right, if you can't find the right uh, uh, way to do it on the screen, but you know, putting your hand up to your ear if somebody's on mute to remind them to unmute. Um, thumbs up sign if you're agreeing with a point. Um, uh, sometimes a jazz wave or just a thumbs up sign um, if you really uh, want to express your support and, uh, uh, for somebody. Try to be on camera. I think with the commission here, we expect our commission members uh, to be on camera. I know sometimes we, we, we acknowledge that sometimes folks have a hard time being on camera for a lot of legitimate reasons, but for our purposes here and with the, this being recorded, I think we want to make sure there's a public record of who's been present and who's contributed. Do mute yourselves when you aren't talking. It is possible sometimes to get feedback that is, is distracting or other background noises um, that make it more difficult for us to have the conversation. And we mentioned that we just talked about chat you know, a minute ago. So those are our group agreements. And with your uh, uh, mutual consent, we'll add these online agreements for the time that we continue to do the work this way. Thank you, Bruce. I think that's, uh, that's real good. Um, and did, um, did everybody was able to sort of see um, uh, Bruce's uh, screen there? So I'm taking that as, as yes. Um, Jordan, I don't know if you want to talk about if you if 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 anybody needs to break out of of the seeing the full screen. I know this question came up at an earlier Zoom meeting I was I was in because um, it's not really clear how to how to do that. For instance, if you had to respond to a, an email on from uh, on completely different subject, or you just needed um, your um, your laptop screen back. Yeah, definitely. So in the in the top right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a few different view options. Uh, you can either have it highlight only the, uh, the person who's speaking or you can do a grid view in most instances uh, when the screen's not being shared. You can also you'll see right next to the speaker view grid view option uh, that there's an enter full screen. Uh, you can also exit full screen if uh, if the screen's being shared to then you know answer an email or, or do what you need to do there. So thank, thanks, Jordan. And, and the, the same as with our regular meetings, if, um, if you've got to take a phone call or if you've got to use the restroom or you've got to let the dog out or something like that, um, you know, just mute yourself and, and go take care of it. Um, you know, this happens while life goes on. So, um, so we, we appreciate everybody's uh, ability to, to spend time uh, on the, the, the work of the commission. So, uh, so the commission certainly respects um, your needs as well. So um, um, uh, I guess just like any good uh, television series, um, when there's a long period of time between episodes, the next episode begins with a quick review of where we're at. So, um, so Bruce, can I turn it over to you to sort of talk us through a little bit about where we've been and Sure, we're just, uh, this is again, just kind of re resetting ourselves um, to, to get our momentum back. Um, and these, these points are listed on, the, on today's agenda that you uh, received previously. But just as a reminder that um, the last couple of months um, have not been lost by any means, especially during the time that the commission hasn't been able to meet, there's been a lot of other activity taking place. So we began by um, affirming our understanding and affirming the charge that we were given from the general court uh, in the legislation that created 
um, the commission. Um, we've, I think, been careful about being sure that we address that charge and at the same time, um, don't take liberty you know, with the charge. We're trying to figure out where those boundaries are that we're expected to uh, operate within um, as we uh, help the legislature address this challenge about um, uh, relative to school funding and the ways in which we, we fund our schools. Um, you'll remember that um, Dave uh, introduced and asked us to think about the, 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 the sort of decision-making process that we'll move, that we'll use um, as the commission meets, uh, beginning with, uh, again, defining the problem, um, identifying what data and information are available that bear on the problem and what data are not available, um, looking at prior efforts uh, to uh, address this issue, um, uh, over the last uh, couple of decades or more. Some of the members of the commission, of course, have, were quite involved in those earlier efforts. And so we have a great uh, link back to the wisdom um, of prior deliberations and, and solutions. And then um, uh, others uh, join the commission who are helping us you know, move forward and look, look to the future as well. We've had a number of presentations at our face-to-face -face commission meetings um, from uh, NCSL, uh, ECS, the Department of Education, Department of Revenue Administration, Department of Justice, the School Fair, Fund Fair Funding Project. Um, and we all, all of that, of course, uh, is in, in the records of, of our minutes, uh, both the presentations and the materials that were provided as well. We've not had any presentations um, uh, since we stopped meeting face-to-face. Uh, -face, um, and, and we'll want to, at some point, uh, uh, get back onto track with getting sort of the key expertise and data that we need as a whole commission. Um, and then the individual work groups that have been established, fiscal policy, adequacy and distribution framework and engagement, all may take advantage of presentation from experts as well as those work groups engage in their meetings. We held a, a, a key uh, stakeholder briefing for uh, the leadership um, organizations in the state relative to public education, including the school administrators, the New Hampshire NEA, the Charitable Foundation, the um, um, uh, Council of Business and Education, the School Boards Association, Reaching Higher, the Association of Special Education Administrators, uh, uh, the Governor's Council on Diversity, and the CTE Advisory Board were all, were all represented at that key stakeholder briefing. Uh, we shared with them what the commission's charge and, and process is and began to hear some initial feedback from them about their sort of hopes and concerns for the commission as it does its work. We've been developing a kind of a task list, a very complex um, uh, eight or nine month task list for the commission to be sure that we achieve our benchmarks and accomplish our goals. Um, it seems that every day there's another task or, or set of tasks to add to that list but that's all part of this uh, initial work of uh, being sure that we begin on the right foot um, so we don't miss anything and have to double back later um, or, or repeat ourselves unnecessarily. And finally, um, we released um, a request for proposals um, at about the time we stopped meeting, um, seeking bidders um, from uh, national organizations that have experience, expertise in um, public education, fiscal policy, um, and uh, matters of adequacy, uh, with an emphasis on the former. We received, um, uh, uh, we received responses from that RFP. Uh, a small screening committee, a subcommittee of this commission was formed to um, conduct a, a bidder's call uh, with potential uh, applicants. Um, and then once uh, the applications were received, uh, that screening committee has been hard at work reviewing those proposals, developing a set of um, scoring criteria uh, uh, against which to judge those proposals. Um, uh, this week, um, the, the, your chair, Dave, and I will be uh, consulting with uh, the references that were identified by our, uh, by our bidders, by the folks that responded. And the screening committee hopes to essentially complete most of its work um, by the end of the current week. And when this commission meets again a week from today, uh, we hope to provide to have a recommendation for you to act on and we'll provide you 
the appropriate materials in between uh, to justify whatever recommendations we might come forward with. So that's, um, that's where we are. Um, the final report from the external consultant uh, is, was moved back a little bit to August 31st. However, we've anticipated in, in our conversations with the folks that have been applying to us that there will be some ongoing relationships and continued um, sort of discrete analyses necessary between August 1st, August 31st and the time the commission submits its final report to the legislature um, on December 1st. So I'll, I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions. Iris has both a physically Iris. raised hand and a digitally raised hand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether either before next Monday's meeting or at Monday's meeting when you make the recommendation as to which uh, outfit to go with, whether you were also going to provide information on the other folks that bid so we could get some sense of the choices that were made. You know, that, that's a that's a good question, Iris. And um, and I I'm I'm a little hesitant to um, actually I'm a lot hesitant to do that only because the the RFP re bidding and review process is is really somewhat um, confidential out of fairness to the the um, organizations that that put in proposals and um, and and uh, and you know the, it's it, for, for sure the, the 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 various proposals are not sort of um, at the uh, you know they're not open to other you know bidders to to really take a look at they're really private documents so so I understand I, that they wouldn't be public information but it seems that it's information that the members of the commission should have access to okay no i i'm i, I i'm i'm uh, you know i i hear what you're saying on that iris let me let me do this um uh, when um when our uh, our uh, our proposal review team is going to be um, uh, meeting again uh, shortly. And let me tell you, I, uh, Bruce, I don't know if you laid out who's on the proposal review team. I did not mention that, no. So ahead. it's um, it's uh, Bruce, Jay, Mel, Rick, Ladd, um, uh, Chris Dwyer, Dick Ames, and myself. And, um, and I'm ex officio, I won't be voting, just to clarify that. Right, right. And, um, and so, so uh, uh, basically since the, since the proposal was since the rfp was released on march 19th um uh this group has has attended um uh, uh, a bidder's call on uh, on april 3rd proposals were due april 24th the evaluation team uh had its for the review team um had its uh, preliminary review meeting on april 29th uh, we conducted interviews with the um, with the respondents on um, uh, uh, on Thursday last week. Thursday, yeah, Friday last week. Friday, um, Friday. Um, May first. Um, uh, we um, uh, we had a um, a, a mid review uh, following the um, uh, reviewing the proposals and 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 interviewing the uh, the respondents. Uh, this morning, um, May 4th. Uh, we're going to be conducting reference checks May 5th and May 6th, so Tuesday and Wednesday this week. And then the evaluate the, the proposal review team is going to be um, scoring on, um, on Friday, May 8th this week, and have a uh, recommendation, hope to have a recommendation to bring forward to the commission when we meet again on Monday, May, um, May 11th. Um, so, so you know, these are some of the things that have been sort of going on in the um, uh, in the background. I think we we're very fortunate to uh, to have that RFP um, uh, issue uh, uh, go out because if that hadn't hadn't gone out, a lot of we would have lost a lot of time in um, uh, in what we were um, in what we need to what we need to accomplish. But I will raise that question uh, with. Um, uh, with the review team and um, and uh, see what we can bring forward on the 11th. But let me put a question out to the commission members. Um, uh, what 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 do you feel that that 
you would need to hear uh, about on the um, uh, next week in order to um, uh, be in a position to uh, uh, move forward with with a proposal. Anybody want to jump in on that? I mean, I hear what Iris is saying, wanting to sort of um, uh, some high level on on what the other proposals look like. Is that right? Yes, thanks. And then some understanding of what led the committee to the conclusion it came oh, to. Absolutely. By virtue of what, what the winning proposal had over the ones that didn't win. The rationale. Yeah. Sure. I mean, in terms of the work that's going to be done, the most I, I, I did get a chance to read through the checklist you're using for scoring, mm -hmm. um, and I found a lot of it was was sort of um, you know organizational competency and um, things like that that are important. But um, in terms of our, our specific mission, um, I guess in four and five were were the core for me, which was. You know what what approach are they going to take right and is it an approach that's in keeping with where we think we want to be going and can they adapt to changing you know are they stuck on one way of looking at this mm -hmm. or can we see where we're going to go great no that's that's excellent guidance i think we would we'll, we'll definitely be um be be doing that and that's th those are things that have been you know, top in mind on the uh, on the review team uh, during um, uh, you know during our discussions and during the uh, interviews with the uh, with the respondents. Uh, anybody else have anything else on um, on uh, uh, on what what you may want to uh, see in a uh, uh, in a recommendation next week? Good. Well, if anything comes up, please you know reach out to um, to me or Bruce on. Dave, um, Dave Bill had his hand. Yeah. Bill had his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't didn't see you, Bill. Barbara as well. Yeah. I just wanted to know: Are we looking at uh, more than one? Like at one point, I'd heard discussions about you know reaching higher would supply some data support, and then another organization uh, would you know a national firm. I, are we looking at more than one or just a single with this? No, nope, we're looking at more than one. Okay. Any, any sense of the number? And, um, and, and I guess, so just to add to Iris's point, it'd be good to know what the categories are that we're looking for and who we're looking at. Okay. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say, Bill. Same thing. Thank you. Okay. You no, know, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, any, anybody else? Chris? Got to unmute. Uh, just to be clear, so the answer to the last question, while we had more than one bidder, we're not looking to award more than one contract. I just wanted to make sure that wasn't oh. misunderstood. Right. Oh, that that actually did clarify quite a bit. Thank you, Chris. Um, so so there's uh, there's not, we're not contemplating having more than one consultant to the commission. That that's that's correct. Thank you. Any further questions here? Jay? Uh, you know, David, having been a part of that process, and uh, there's six people on that and that group that's been working with you and Bruce. And uh, uh, yeah, I think we can easily summarize the strengths and weaknesses of uh, the proposals we evaluated. And uh, I think that that can address the uh, questions that I've just heard. Good, good. Thanks, Jay. Um, Mary, did you have your hand up? Yes, just a quick question. Um, in terms of the cost of the award, did you get any concerns from bidders about um, the amount of money that was involved to accomplish such a big task? Um, I haven't heard of any concerns um, on that. I and uh, and uh, you know we'll get into it more next week. But we did probe around to to make sure that uh, 
that look, uh, you know, our, our major elements being left out, are we not going to be able to accomplish that? These were questions that we had um, for the respondents. Dick, did I, did you have your hand up? Yes, yes, thank you. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I just wanted to, in response to Bill Ardinger's good question, um, make clear that at this point, we're not, this is, this is an award to one, it's one contract. Uh, there may be in the future the need for another consultant, and I think we've reserved for that possibility. So just to be clear on that. Um, and then um, I think uh, the suggestions for the presentation, for the discussion uh, with the commission as a whole are very good. And uh, it seems to me that we're well set for that. Thanks, Dick. Yep. David, um, David, I would, I would also yeah. add that the, uh, the quality of the proposals we have received are very rich. Uh, they, they obviously come at the mission uh, in different ways, but uh, as we've reviewed the proposals, we've all been impressed with the thoroughness and uh, really the, uh, the quality, it, it, will, it will be a difficult decision uh, to come forward with you because of, uh, of the detail and uh, how they have addressed uh, the uh, issues that were in the RFP. We've been very pleased with uh, the quality. Good, thank you, thank you, Mel. Iris? Yeah? Yeah, did you have your hand up? No. Nope. Oh, your hand's up. How do we put Iris's hand down? Nope, oh, it's gone now. I never um, put it down. <laughs> I think it was left up from from earlier. Uh, let's see. Anybody else have anything uh, they want to add? Rick, you want to add anything on the Dave proposal Mary, review work? Dave, Mary had her hand up earlier. Oh, I didn't. Yep, yeah, Mary or Mary. She's good. Rick. No, I, I think it's been well covered here, but uh, echoing what Mel had, that the, there are very thorough proposals, well, well done and meaningful. Uh, we need to just go to the next step and check with references to ensure the references are, are paralleling what is in their proposal and, and, and how the, the proposals present various types of information. But all in all, I think we have a wonderful process going on and I think you're going to see a fine recommendation. Great, great. Um, good. Uh, anything else while we're uh, while we're sort of talking about process with the um, with the uh, um, proposals here? Just sort of scanning around. All right. I think we're good on on that. Um, so we're coming on three o'clock right now. Do um, do people want to take a, a few minutes for a, for a break before we get into um, um, really, I think what the what the meat of our conversation is going to be today, which is reviewing the uh, work group charges, reviewing them as a whole, and um, uh, and uh, the plans for uh, work groups to get started on on um, Thursday this week. Is that Bruce? Is that um, so why don't we uh, why don't we recess for um, what five minutes? Five at the most. <laughs> Quick why stretch. don't we recess till three o'clock then, and uh, we'll reconvene uh, shortly.
Okay, let's see if we've got everybody back here. People are coming back online. Dave, Dave Ryan shifted to a freshwater location to catch some fish. I like that. <laughs> I like to spread my seasons out since I live indoors right now. Yeah. Oh, and Carrie's taken up a different uh, location. Let's see, Jen's back. Let's see, we got Val yet. Or John. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we get started? Yep, John's back. I, I'm sure Val's just around the corner. Why don't we um, why don't we get started with the um, with reviewing the work group charges? So, does uh, everybody have a copy of um, of the um, uh, uh, Either the memo that uh, that Bruce sent out uh, earlier, or that your work group um, chairs have um, uh, have sent to you with respect to uh, uh, charges. Because uh, the most important thing is we want everybody to sort of uh, be able to uh, to weigh in on what the various groups are doing and um, uh, and and their approach to uh, 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 to their tasks and uh, uh to the extent we we know that uh yet and um and, and that way as we all you know meet with our groups on friday we've got uh eyes wide open what um uh what the other groups that we're undoubtedly going to have to interface with uh are also um uh looking at so um Dave, excuse me just a reminder that at uh, 1 20 this afternoon jordan sent everybody uh, the the PDF with all of the work group charges on it. If you okay. Can access to that. Okay. <clears throat> and also, I um I I know that um that um, uh, I think David Ryan's probably going to have to uh, drop off in in uh, in about uh, what half hour or something like that to a to another meeting. So so. Um, to, 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 to. And David, you're on the public engagement work group. But what, um, I don't know, where, where do you think we should start on this, Bruce? With adequacy? I think that's always where we start, isn't it? <laughs> no, I think so. We sort of laid that foundation. So yes, there is there is a logic, the method to our madness, right? Yeah, so, so Senator Kahn, can I hand this over to you to talk a little bit about what the adequacy, adequacy work group is going to do and what it all means? Yeah, certainly. Uh, all right. So that was unrehearsed, but good. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so adequacy and distribution, uh, you'll notice there are four tasks there and uh, we've gotten some feedback. And, uh, I guess I'd start with saying uh, I think it's uh, the entire commission uh, ought to feel free to weigh in on the adequacy and distribution conversation. I think it is uh, foundational to our work. Uh, so that uh, developing a definition of what is an adequate education. And I know that we've looked at uh, uh, RSA 193 and uh, some of the details in there, uh, but, but truly the RSAs from 186 to 200 uh, cover various things that schools are required to do. And uh, uh, we, we need to consider uh, what is the, how, how narrow or how broad uh, should this uh, definition be. Uh, and just as one uh, issue that is clear in our charge that we're to consider is uh, uh, early childhood or pre-K education. Uh, so we'll need to give some thought to, is that uh, something that is in or out of our adequacy education definition? And I think that we can agree to, that there are some issues that uh, need to be uh, placed in a parking lot uh, not to be ignored, but uh, uh, not necessarily a part of the, the subsequent evaluations. 
Um, from that definition, uh, which I think we'll start on on Thursday of considering uh, various tangents to uh, uh, an adequate education, uh, we need to start talking about the disparities in opportunities and outcomes, and essentially uh, the inputs, uh, inputs into education, like uh, number of teachers, class size, uh, qualifications of teachers, uh, and uh, uh, the outcomes. Uh, how successful are the students uh, from the educations that they're receiving at 176 different districts around the state? Um, and then there are not just uh, the inputs into the school, but then there are the broader socioeconomic uh, factors uh, that we uh, might wish to consider as uh, parts of a disparity uh, uh, that, that need to be considered uh, as far as creating uh, more uh, common or equalized set of experiences for students. Uh, and, and some of those socioeconomic uh, factors might uh, be geography, uh, density uh, of population around a, a community. Uh, uh, okay, so things that we have not uh, traditionally put into uh, our funding formula. Um, in a third sense then, uh, we need to get to uh, what is the cost of an adequate education. Uh, the words aren't exactly there in suggesting a framework for the distribution of effort and the funding that remedies disparities. Um, but as a former <coughs> chief executive officer I mean, and a uh, chief financial officer, both at the, um, but financial officer for most of my career, um, I know that we can be, we can drive ourselves to cost uh, from the get go if we let ourselves and, uh, and, and uh, frankly, uh, the cost is a function of the quality you want to achieve. And uh, we, we, we should uh, take a look at the, the costs that were uh, put together in 2008, consider how our statutes have changed since 2008 to, uh, in the definition of adequacy and the kinds of disparities that are created around those uh, additional definitions of what's uh, to be offered in schools. Um, so we do need to arrive at uh, what a cost is and what is what would remedy uh, those uh, disparities and come up with a function uh, of cost. Uh, and then along the way, uh, we need to make sure that what we are establishing uh, provides a basis for ongoing review and accountability. Uh, that it's either within the, the range of the data that we currently collect uh, and that there can be periodic reviews of, uh, has it moved the needle? I mean, have, uh, in trying to address disparities uh, with a, uh, a funding distribution, uh, have we uh, moved towards uh, some targets uh, uh, to create a, a more common experience or, or adequate education for all of our students in the state? Um, so that's that's the uh, the formation of a of a framework, and uh, on Thursday we'll begin to dissect both uh, the elements of an adequate education and the uh, data and sources that we can turn to, to uh, begin to uh, address that definition. So, so Jay, um, can you give some sort of, can we talk a little bit about some examples of what disparities could be? Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, just, just so they're getting a, you, you know. Yeah, well, I'll hit, hit that again. Again, th th there are the inputs uh, in disparities, class sizes, uh, teacher, uh, student teacher ratios, uh, uh, the experience that and degrees that's, uh, that the, the teachers uh, have uh, in a school, meaning is there a lot of turnover in, in a school district? Okay. Uh, 
so those those are the inputs that no, that the total resources uh, you know are they spending fifteen thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars on a per student basis uh, those are some of the inputs uh, the socioeconomic factors uh, are uh, is the income val uh, the income of uh, the per family and per capita income uh, uh, differentiated uh, by community we know of course that is uh, <clears throat> and income is usually a uh, uh, a, uh, a the causal relationship to income is related to family education uh, and uh, so we can we can look at uh, either one of those variables as a socioeconomic factor uh, uh, another socioeconomic factor is that uh, how remote uh, that district is and those students from uh, other students and from other educational opportunities that they may have in their community or how concentrated uh, dense is a community. Uh, we certainly have uh, a rural urban or at least a small city uh, kind of uh, environments that are distinguishable in the state of New Hampshire. And then there are outcomes, uh, you know, uh, the proficiencies uh, levels at uh, three grades three through eight, uh, and uh, in high school, uh, and uh, we we can we can take a look at at that at college going rates uh, by district, um, and 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 uh, we need to recognize that. Uh, you know, among our 176 districts, some of those are K through 12. Uh, some of those are uh, uh, just high school. And uh, that are there uh, differences there in uh, in different uh, requirements that each school uh, has to face relative to the cost, average cost of a student. So anyway, those are some of those disparities that. Uh, We'll need to identify what, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and some of that can come from uh, literature search, uh, meaning that uh, uh, there are other states that have uh, the dichotomies that, that we have in New Hampshire. We can be informed by uh, the uh, uh, factors that they've uh, identified as most significant. Uh, and then test those uh, on our own uh, available data and uh, observations uh, that uh, administrators and key leaders in our state uh, have about our education system. Questions for Jay or thoughts? Iris had her hand up first. I think. Oh, uh, Iris? Thanks. Um, there you are. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate Jay saying that the um, words weren't quite there for the task of costing because I don't see it in the words. But um, I'm taking this document as a kind of work in progress for the committee's charge, not as a charge that's so fixed we can't see where we go yep. and understand amongst each other that costing is certainly part of our task. Um, I'm also wondering when we get to the third step that suggested that we um, create this framework for distribution of effort to remedy the disparities we identify. I'm wondering is the distribution framework supposed to only uh, rectify those disparities or is it supposed to fund an adequate education or is it supposed to do both? And I think that's an issue that Bill has raised for us to discuss and one I figured the uh, work group would really get into discussing. Uh, so that's my reaction and thank you. Good, uh, I, I think those are fair comments. You know, I think at this point, nothing, uh, let's try to be as inclusive of ideas as we can uh, as we start to build uh, clearly, this is a funnel kind of experience, right? We've got to start with a broad school of thought and, uh, and then try to, to narrow ourselves to uh, what we most need to accomplish. Right, right. And, and, and the, the, there's obviously going to have to be, you know, regular conversations 
um, you know, within the full commission on what the adequacy group, but with what what all the work groups are are doing, and um, and and you know, I I I think when it comes to adequacy as well, it it um, it obviously encompasses uh, a lot, and Jay just got got into that. But what I did not hear him talking about is redefining some of the things that that uh, that that are sort of state minimum minimum standards for for um, uh, uh, edu for public education, such as two years of high school math. I mean that I I don't think I mean unless I'm wrong I don't think that's what this commission is about, and I don't think that's how. We're, we're tackling the the adequacy question is by redefining what what um, what minimum standards are for for public education in um, in the state, but instead considering as part of adequacy the um, the elements that that Jay was talking about, such as um, um, disparities. Whether whether those are socioeconomic disparities or whether they're disparities that that hey it's 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 different it's there's major differences and I'm just I'm picking a you know a, you know a district out of a hat um, uh, different challenges in um, in the Kearsarge Regional District than there are in the Concord School District for instance and 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 how how those uh, may get factored in. Is that sort of along the line of thinking, Jay? Yes. Okay. 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 Um, some hands. I think I saw Dick. Yeah. And and then Mary. Yeah. Um, I appreciate this will be a dynamic process, and I think there'll be an evolution as the each of these work groups go forward. Um, as as we began to set up these work groups, there was the fiscal resource work, work group, and there was the adequacy and costing of adequacy work group. It seems to have moved to be the adequacy work group, dropping costing from from its early statement of its charge. I think that's a mistake. I think costing should be uh, in the initial mission and charge of this. When we think about the fiscal resource group and its work, we need, we're not going to be figuring the costs that we're trying to fund. Those are going to come to us. We're going to be, because we have to, I think, working off of a set of different scenarios, different levels of cost. And then we'll be thinking about fiscal resources needed to meet those scenarios uh, with variations from municipality or school district uh, to, to the next one. But, uh, but we're not doing the costing of an adequate education. That I believe is the job of the adequacy committee, which I would- I think that's in, the, that's in the task list. No, it isn't. It is not. No. Defining and costing adequacy. Where? Yeah. What are you looking at? I'm looking at, obviously, I'm looking at a different piece of paper than, than what you're looking at. So uh, I'm looking at the one where, where, we, where we started. The second bullet is determine costs for each version, you know. Not the document we were just sent. Yeah. Okay. I haven't I, even I haven't opened that. So. Yeah, that, uh, the document we have. Uh, Dave is uh, it's the adequacy slash distribution work group. That's what George and it, said. It's, its tasks are one: develop a definition of adequate education. Two: identify disparities in opportunities and outcomes. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it now. Yeah. Okay. You see that? Yep. So I'm I'm uh, coming down on the side of getting costs back in there at the front end. Uh, you know, you look historically at this whole saga of uh, trying to figure out what is an adequate education and how to fund it. And the court cases 
the task that was assigned to the legislature back in the uh, earlier part of this century um, in the 2000s was to develop a definition of an adequate education and to develop the cost of an ad adequate education. Uh, we're working on both factors here, and we should be. Um, but I, I guess I would say that as far as adequate education goes in, I don't think it's a wholesale re reworking. A lot of good work's been done on that. Um, but there are things that need to be uh, identified that are omitted, or maybe there's something in there that doesn't need to be there, uh, working around the edges of it. Um, but then we need to cost it out. And yeah. that's really the core task, I think, of, uh, of that work group, costing out an adequate mm -hmm. education, whether it's teacher ratios that go into what I would call the base okay. cost, or in many uh, school finance studies, it's called the foundation uh, cost at the beginning before you add on variations for um, whether it's uh, the rural nature of a district or the level of education. We were talking earlier today about uh, maybe elementary is different than middle than high in terms of, uh, of the inputs, the, the resources that need to go into that base calculation and then having uh, variations for the, uh, the demographics, the makeup of the student body, uh, whether it's a, uh, a school body that's predominantly uh, coming from uh, relatively uh, uh, less uh, resourced uh, families and communities or, or not. And, uh, and whether special education is a major component in the population or less so or more so. So we're having variations, you know, what we call them, uh, I can't come up with the exact word, but we, we add a, uh, a weight. Wait. Yeah. We can call it a weight um, for these other factors. Um, so we need to cost all of that out. And I don't see anywhere else it's going to be done. If it's not done by the adequacy work group. Right, right. So Jay, was that, yeah. There's no disagreement that we've got to do a cost. Yeah. So we will. <laughs> and and we, can, we can make it more explicit so that, uh, that that's uh, not, a, not in question. Uh, I, I will reiterate uh, that uh, a cost is a function of what you want that to be. I can tell you, that, I mean, I can, be, again, I, 43 years in financing education. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you, you, you tell me an outcome and I'll give you a cost. And, so, or you give me a cost and I'll give you an outcome. Um, the, the, we need to be clear about our goals. And if we're not clear about our goals, the costs won't matter a whole lot. Uh, because it can be, you can drive it to any number. That's just a, an observation. I wanna get to cost too, because that's uh, without, without having a, a target, we can, you know, the range on this is gonna be way too wide. We're going to have to narrow ourselves, and we we've said we're going to have three different costs uh, that 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 we consider, and uh, we can make that explicit in in the charge to this group, uh, so that the the whole commission needs to weigh in on uh, both the, what is what's a part of uh, the adequate education and what is the the cost uh, and the distribution of those costs. Uh, in order to achieve a certain outcome. So, so Jay, Jay, obviously the 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 work from our uh, research um, contractor is is going to have a lot to do with 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 um, your work group's um, process going forward. Is that correct? Hope so. Yeah, because um, I think that's that's. I mean, they're they're obviously going to have have elements with both fiscal policy and public engagement. As well, but uh, but but essentially the 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 RFP centers around uh, addressing um, you know uh, identifying the factors such as disparities, such as outcomes, um, and um, and providing some sort of cost basis for for all of those. Yes. Yeah. And and what's our what's our available data? It's the same question that uh, I think the fiscal resource committee is going to. Uh, uh, 
have yeah. as well. Uh, we're going to be driven by the data that we've got available to us. Well, and we need to make sure that we and, and to the consultants, of course. Right, right. But also, if 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 we need certain data that that um, you know that we do not know if it's available, we need to either find out if it's available or find out if it can be collected. Um, so, uh, so we just don't know what those things are. Yeah, right now. I mean, we 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 know what the DOE has. We know what the DRA has. Um, uh, you know, publicly available through their websites. But um, but if there's other data we need, I think we need to be in a position to ask, that's for sure. Um, it, it might be valuable for Bruce to, to describe, uh, you know, it, that everybody from the commission can uh, uh, be party to the discussions of the work, work groups. Yes, we'll be posting um, these revised charges as they evolve uh, on, our, on our website. And then of course the minutes or summaries of the work group meetings on the website as well. So they'll be available to the work groups and of course to the public as well. So we'll, it, it, this will be a transparent process. And as others have pointed out, um, uh, this, is, this is an evolving process. The comments about not including language related to costing on this document are, you know, are, are great because uh, I think the members of the adequacy work group, at least Jay and I and others, see the cost issue as sort of that's the big forest. These are the trees we need to look at in order to even understand what the forest looks like. So implicit here, of course, is what is the cost of an adequate education and therefore, and then what kind of revenues need to be raised to achieve that? How do you raise those revenues? How do they get distributed and so on? And, and I guess um, while I have the floor, I'll, I'll, I'll suggest that we might wanna continue to move forward with the other work groups as well today to make sure they each have a chance for a little conversation. As Absolutely, well. yeah, because we've got about a half hour left here. Yeah. Um, so, so I think what I'm hearing is, is while the while the cost element uh, of it was was implicit, we probably should be putting that in black and white in the um, yes. uh, in the charge, just so that yeah. just so that all the all the members can and and the public knows knows exactly what uh, you know what we're moving um, towards. The um, um, uh, the the point that um, that that uh, Bruce is making also. Uh, all of the members are welcome to join to uh, to attend any of the uh, work group meetings. We're not limited by quorum or or um, or anything like that. All the work group meetings, while the while the work group membership has less than a quorum of of commission members uh, on it, they're all posted as 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 you know meetings, and they're open to the public and. Um, and uh, and I and I think that's important because I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be interested in following what all three commission, what all three work groups are doing, and uh, that's uh, that's actually the primary reason why we're uh, we're sort of teeing these off on um, on on you know all days with uh, 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and 3 p.m. tea times, uh, so that uh, so that any of us and any of the members of the public who want to attend all of them can um, uh, can do so. Um, Dave, one other comment, uh, just yeah. as a reminder that at subsequent meetings of the full commission, a significant part of each of those meetings will be to hear from the respective work groups to be sure that we're knitting those together. So that's the coordination and alignment of these three work groups will be a, a major purpose of the full commission meetings in addition to other deliberations or other expert presentations that we have going forward. And we'll talk about our schedule towards the end of today's meeting. Right, right. So um, so we'll let's um let's without objection, let's um let's shift over to the fiscal policy and then we'll wrap up with uh, with public engagement um, uh, quickly and, and of course we can take feedback as we're going along on 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 this too. But um, but today would be great because it'll help to inform our first um, uh, work group meeting. So uh, just looking at fiscal policy, uh, uh, you know, at, 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 at one level, you know, sort of based on what we just heard with adequacy, uh, fiscal policy is basically going to be responsive to, um, to the needs of, um, of what, the, um, what the adequacy work group um, uh, 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 puts, for, puts forward. But at the same time, um, fiscal policy is going to require 
a lot of um, uh, attention to it, a lot of data gathering, uh, a lot of modeling, and, uh, and uh, along with the adequacy work, a lot of communication with, um, with an engagement with the public. Um, uh, because fiscal policy, yeah, that's tax policy. And, um, and where's it all coming from? Um, uh, I, I, I like to say we're already paying for it in New Hampshire because we're paying for it with local property tax dollars. So the question is, is that the way, is that the way we're going to do it forever? Or are we going to be looking at some, uh, some different ways of, uh, of doing it? And, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, a big point in, in, uh, in I think the fiscal policy, uh, question is going to be, um, um, you know, the fairness or as what the courts have put out the, um, the proportional and reasonable. I think that's what, um, what, um, um, uh, attorney will, uh, talked about when, uh, when the attorney general's office was, was, uh, speaking to the commission about the, the court case, um, court, court decisions. I mean, and, uh, a, another term that, that, that I've seen actually in, in, uh, and in one of the proposals that we're uh, we're reviewing is this concept of uh, fiscal neutrality, and um, and and that's probably something that um, that the um, that the fiscal policy work group will uh, will also um, uh, look at. And what that's basically saying is your uh, your your I guess your access to um, to a um, to an adequate education is. Um, is not dependent upon uh, upon which district you um, uh, you live in, and um, and uh, and it 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 provides a basis of um, of of you know sort of you know uh, what you know how how adequate education is uh, is arrived at um, uh, uh, equally throughout the or equitably throughout the the state. So um, so anyway on. Um, on uh, uh, this work group, I'm chairing it. John Beardmore, former commissioner, of DRA, Mary Heath, Chris, Chris Dwyer, Dick Ames uh, from Ways and Means, and, and Rick Ladd. And um, uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, that I think we want to um, to begin with is is really identifying what sort of um, uh, data uh, is out there, what data we need in order to begin modeling. Um, what um, uh, you know, what what sort of approaches might uh, might come forward, and uh, or what what sorry, begin to model uh, what approaches we might take given um, given various funding levels that uh, that come up from the um, the adequacy committee, the adequacy work group. Um, that all said, um, you know, I think there's there's probably a practical. Um, you know, consideration we need to look at as well, and um, and while I'm while I'm not saying that that fiscal policy should should um, have a strong influence on what the adequacy work group does, I think um, uh, that's why we're all having to sort of work in parallel with each other so that so that each work group's efforts can help inform um, the other work groups because. Uh, because certainly, um, certainly, you know, you know, we we, you know, recognize, um, um, you know, certain practicalities here in New Hampshire that that may or may not be, you know, be viable, and uh, we need to make sure that that we consider, um, you know, fiscal policy um, options um, uh, that um, that that. You know, some may not be viable, and some will be viable, and uh, and you know we just need to eyes wide open consider um, all of them. So, so uh, with that, uh, happy to take some comments um, on uh, where we go. Bill, yes, sir. Thank you. So, um, the fiscal policy committee is talking. I see a lot about various tax options. That's great. The one question in fiscal policy, it's not just tax policy, it's fiscal policy. So that my, my man, former Commissioner Beardmore, he was not only 
head of tax policy, he was a budget director. And so the question is, is it within the, your intended scope of fiscal policy to talk about what you know share of the total burden of public education costs is borne by the state budget versus local budgets so that you make an assessment of you know if i mean what one could say you know on the adequacy commission we could try to determine that the cost should be 17,000 a pupil but that would make the state share of the cost potentially go to you know 90% of the total and it would break the state budget from the way who's going to consider or is it within your committee to consider what is possible as a matter of state budget constraints thank you yeah thank, i think that's that's a great question bill and i, I think that does fall under um, under fiscal policy and and of course everything falls under the whole the full commission here um we, you know with what we recommend going forward but but you know when when you when you take a look at at data from across you know the other 50 i mean the 50 states and bill you and i have talked about this that uh, you know where's new hampshire right now where's massachusetts right now not not too not too different um uh when you when you take a look at the at, at some of those numbers uh where's vermont very different um and um and and obviously you know just just these two neighboring states have very very different tax policy than new hampshire and clearly different fiscal policy um than um than new hampshire when it comes to um to to public education so so um you know i think tied i, I think that's a great question i think the answer is yes that 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 we have to take a look at that and 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 also i think that when we when we end up um, looking at the pros and cons of you know what were you know the the various um, uh, uh, policies that we that we model uh, is that we 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 somehow we, you know we we know the pro, we we develop pros and cons um, on it um, uh, you know uh, you know identify you know identify things that are that clearly get get um, Get highlighted in court decisions, such as proportionality and and reasonableness, and and how that ties in with the with the sort of fiscal neutrality, you know, uh, argument. But uh, but uh, uh, there's, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's the bulk. The, I think that's the work of the um, of of the fiscal policy work group. Rick. Hi. Yes. Um... On the, on the fiscal policy here, uh, first of all, I want to just talk about the process we are going to go forward with our meetings as a whole. And as you and I have discussed before, these work groups may meet one week, the following week the commission meets, so we're all cognizant of what's going on between the adequacy group, the fiscal group, or the engagement group. Uh, but dealing with fiscal right here now, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that Yes, we, we, we probably can come up with a wonderful recommendation that's going to require additional costing for an adequate education. We may not, who knows, but it's likely we will. And I'm concerned about the recent COVID type economy we're in right now. And we, we're gonna have to be very cautious in, in moving forward at this point in time with asking our public for any additional revenues or even significantly changing the revenue system that we have for receiving revenue. As you know, like Vermont, 90% of education is paid for by the state, uh, right? Uh, for us, it's, it's, it's probably, you know, 30% or thereabouts. Uh, so I think we're going to have to be careful. This is what's been put out by the governor in Virginia, that we have to look at our priorities right now and be very cautious in seeking more at this time. Rick, I think that's a that's a that's a fair statement, and and I think that that also should be part of what uh, what 
fiscal policy work group does, but also what the what the commission uh, ultimately does too. And and you know what I take from that are also considerations for um, for timing. Rick, yes, you know th th things like timing of um, of of fiscal policy changes, but also you know in the past. Um, uh, you know this state, and I and I think I've I've read that that you know you know this is fairly common recommendation. Our hold harmless provisions that um, that that uh, you know prevent any sort of abrupt change in possible. But considering these things, and I think these are these are all things that we're going to have to look at. Yeah, I, I, we're going to have to look at that. The hold harmless kind of scares me a little bit. Pennsylvania had that, and it turned into whole harmless harmless for life and 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 we did the same thing we knocked that out back in 2011 and we went with stabilization right um, well stabilization was essentially the same thing well no not not exactly but it yes it did the same thing and that that's the concern i am all for looking at our adequacy formula and really putting in there what we need now versus what is needed back or what's happening now versus what happened in 2008 or, or prior to that. Right. You can do it in a weighted, motion, weighted way though that allows that formula to be jiggled as we go and as our economy changes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. Uh, anything else while, while we're on fiscal policy? Um, Dave. Yep. I assume, yep, and this is subsumed in the conversation we just had, that this committee would also recommend what might be categorical funding versus what might end up being formula funding, uh, and various ways of looking at that. You know, what might be in a formula and what might what might need to be treated in different different ways fiscally. Right. I. You know, that's a good question. I. I'm thinking that comes out of adequacy and distribution because um because not not like 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 even what the legislature did this past year when we when we introduced um um the fiscal disparity aid uh that you know is is sort of that that's that's separate from from i think adequacy but it's but it's but it's certainly part of distribution. At least it is right now. I can't hear what anybody's saying. That's right. <laughs> yeah, fiscal capacity disparity aid was created in you know, seven to um, right to address those disparities outside of adequacy because at that time the way we interpreted the court ruling we couldn't do it with inadequacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, it feels like it, it really is something that crosses over the two um, the two committees, um, as as does distribution to me. But um, obviously, we're going to be talking about it as a whole commission. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to note. I'm going to mark it down um, as some of the things that I want to make sure we put on our task list, so that. Mm -hmm. So that we we keep them we we keep an eye on those things and know to work with uh, with um, the adequacy um, you know group uh, um, you know on some of these issues. So, um, hey, hey Dave. Yeah, Bill. It's Bill. Yep. Gotcha. Just to follow on Chris's point because I think it's important, Chris. I've been thinking of the 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 um, the adequacy and distribution work group is the one that figures out okay, let's try and evaluate, um, among other things, the differences in qualities and needs of communities and then methods of getting state aid to those communities. So when you talk about categorical grants, foundation grants, things like that, I'm hearing it as kind of initially within that, that adequacy distribution of aid group. Whereas fiscal policy seems more tax policy and budget. And I've heard you chatting, Chris, a couple of times, and I want you to make sure that you double check with your expertise and interest that 
um, that adequacy distribution doesn't deserve your great attention too, because I, I think that's kind of where it is. But as I understand it now, thank you, sorry. Nope, thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, let's see, we gotta save some time for, uh, for public engagement. Um, Mel and Bruce, where are you? I'll just say that, um, I'll say as we move there, um, let me be sure to folks note that uh, Michelle Holtz-Shannon has joined us. Michelle is Director Hi, of Michelle. Mutual Listens and the Carsey staff. And Michelle's gonna be working closely with Mel on engagement while Carrie finishes up her dissertation over the next five weeks or so. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that folks know that Michelle is, is a staff uh, member here along mm -hmm. with Jordan and Carrie and me, and we'll be working closely with, with Mel on engagement. I'll stop there and okay. turn it over to Mel and, and Michelle and Carrie. Okay, so so the issue of uh, public engagement, obviously, with the, in this shelter-in-place environment, uh, is going to be challenging. Uh, but I think the overall goal is is this for for me anyway. <clears throat> As we come up with recommendations, it's very important that in order to have an intelligent conversation, people need to understand what this issue is all about. And so our, our task, our goal, or at least my goal at this point in time, <clears throat> is to provide a number of, of um, interventions within the community so that that informed conversation can, can in fact take place. One of the goals we have is to try to identify some of the issues that are out there that the other two work groups need to deal with. But in order to do that, they also have to have some sense of understanding of how this, how this works. Uh, so we have to be able to clarify those are the issue, those areas with which the other two work groups are working in to get feedback from the communities at large. And also for me is also to try to create a, um, a, a group of informed citizens that when we come up with a final recommendation, they'll be able to understand what that recommendation is. Now, they may agree or disagree with it. That's gonna be the challenge. But the issue is, is that there will be in fact an informed conversation moving forward. Uh, obviously, this is a complex, uh, this is a complex issue. And one of the concerns that we have and we have been dealing with, uh, with the vendors that have uh, responded, is that what happens after the study is all done, the recommendations are all made, what happens in the next step? This is what I call the so what moment. That you do all this work in the background, you create this recommendation, so what? That means what's gonna happen to it as it relates to dealing with developing public policy. So as you look at the information that was sent out to you, you'll see that there are various areas that we are in fact dealing with. Uh, we've already had um, activity that has been going on. Uh, we've had the stakeholder group meeting met in March before all the pandemic stuff started. We had a very successful meeting there, getting from them some of the issues that they want to deal with. We also have been, uh, we also surveyed our own committee to begin to identify some of the issues that they're, they want to deal with, and that would be part of the conversation that we're going to have on the 7th. You note in there that there's, there will be a survey. We've already contacted the survey center at uh, UNH. They are prepared to have eight to 10 questions on their survey that's going to go out about school funding so that we can gather information from, from a random sampling of uh, citizens in the state. We've been in touch with uh, Reaching Higher and others dealing with trying to get the student voice in here. Now, some may say, why do we need a student voice? Student voice is important here. Students bring to schools a much deeper, a much deeper and richer understanding of their needs of learning. And oftentimes they are put to the side allowing adults to be the only voice in the room. And our sense is that that student voice is in fact uh, very important. The community-wide conversations are gonna be very important. And this goes back to the, what I said at the outset, of, this is what's gonna be the challenge of how do we provide engagements with people 
uh, obviously via Zoom, et cetera, uh, but to try to have uh, people from around the state be able to engage in these conversations to provide feedback and feedback on their issues as well as some of the research that we begin to find and get feedback on what, what our folks are saying. So those are some of the things that we'll be dealing with. Um, I'm very excited about it um, and um, I'm open for, for questions as well as the other committee members if they'd like to make some comments too. Question slots for Mel. Yes, Kareem. Just want to reiterate the student voice piece. I mean, we're hearing all of that within the civics instruction and how to engage more students in the process. And we have an opportunity here that's, you know, prevalent all over the state that could engage students in some way. So I just want to reiterate that that, that really is a, a, a big piece for me. Great, thanks, Green. Um, uh, Michelle, Bruce, or, or Carrie, anything to add on this? Yeah, I'd like to. I also like to thank Carrie for the work she's done. I know she's about to cloister herself as she enters the uh, last pathway here to her PhD, but she's been very helpful in uh, pulling this material together. And uh, thank you, Carrie, and I wish you well in the next uh, six weeks in your endeavor. I'll just make a comment. I know Rick has his hand up. I'll just make a quick comment. Um, you'll notice that uh, you, you may be thinking that our report from the external consultant right now, that report's due August 31st. In the early fall, in September, we'll be doing these community-wide sort of all-call conversations around the state, which will give us more input. And in our conversations with potential uh, contractors, the consultants, um, they understand that they may, uh, that they'll be receiving additional input after August 31 that may cause them to refine, modify, expand, and so on, the recommendations they had made to us as of August. So there's always this sort of sequencing and timing challenges that we have within the constrained amount of time. And, and I, I also say the conversations we've had with them, we have asked them uh, specifically on how to package some of the information that they have so that it is um, very clear and uh, understandable to uh, the body politic out there. Um, Rick, Rick. Add, uh, two documents I provided. This is a short one and there will be a longer one that's provided as a working document and a point of conversation for the um, work group meeting on Thursday that um, Michelle will be um, joining with Mel and, and the work group members and, and whoever else may wanna join. So there's, there, these are talking pieces that'll help kind of build a strategy about how to integrate some of the information from the other work groups into the questions we need to ask and being very considerate about who we're inviting um, to which which event, um, and that includes um, some serious thought about how student voice is involved throughout all of that. Great. Rick, Rick you had a question? Yeah, yeah, I did, Mel. Uh, Mel, when you're looking for your student voice, um, I would suggest that we expand the word student to mean also all those graduates from our high school that maybe often a world of work for the first year or two or third, uh, so we can get their reflection on how well our system prepared them for their career, their job, uh, their life that they're experiencing. Also for our college students that just recently, you know, have, are, are on the way from high school, let's say into their sophomore year. Those are the students which we need to really pick up on, find out, you know, what they feel and about their education they received K through 12. My second question for you, Mel, right now would be, how do we get the information back from our public? Uh, we had a lot of engagements throughout the state here uh, done in the last year regarding you know, our, our disparities, our inequities from my town to other communities. And the common thread that I heard here in Haverhill was, yes, we need to be funded more. We need more, we need more. And that is correct. We are a hurting community. However, 
the question was never posed to them, how do you feel we should acquire this additional revenue? Uh, I think that's a very important part of this equation as fiscal will be looking at. Um, how do we go about in this day of receiving the revenue necessary to support an adequate education? Thanks. Thank you. Not yes, much. that's a that's a that's a a, a really big point, uh, Rick. Uh, because you know, if we if we if we sort of generally say that, hey, you know, it's being paid for already. It's just being paid for this certain way, and um, with the exception, and I'll, and I'll put an exception that there are certainly districts that are not able to to pay for things that a lot of districts uh, are doing. And and what the adequacy work group may consider to be part of a uh, an adequate education, and um, uh, uh, so you know so I, I but ab absolutely I mean that that um, public engagement piece is going to be very important when it comes to um, to asking those questions, Rick. Yeah, what, I think what one, one of the things. Go ahead, Greg. Just to follow up to that though, Dave. Um, Within my particular community, they would say, yes, we really do need to beef up our education. But if we decided we were going to come back, I'll just take something, a business tax, increase that, or some other that's going to hit the small business. You're going to hear people saying, no, I can't go there. So there's, it, it's, we're going to have to mm -hmm. get this information in a way that it's going to be help us making a, a decision at the end, which is going to have a good chance of going forward. Mm -hmm. and one of the things I think, Rick, uh, that you've heard me talk about this before in committee, is that you know there's there's a lot of conversation statewide about workforce development, but there's little conversation about what that means to rural or to rural New Hampshire or to those poorer communities. And I think one of the my bias, I think, and my thought is, how do we move from talking about my kid? or my students, to our students, to our children. And to look at how, if we're gonna really have a, a workforce, to look, to look at a workforce through the education system, we need to look at how a, a, a child, a student up in Berlin has the same opportunities as a student in uh, Concord. And that, I think that's one of the challenges that we have, particularly in the adequacy area, of, of, as we try to define what adequacy is, and then how do you fund what we define? And then you go to the community and say, okay, if this is what you want, this is what it's gonna take. Do you agree with it or not? Because I think we have a tendency to isolate our thinking to our own community without beginning to look to see how we can look at it from a statewide perspective as it relates to the various types of communities that we have across the state. So that every child has an equal educational opportunity because we know right now that's a challenge particularly in those rural areas or those impoverished areas. But that's um, kind of the kind of conversation we need to have in this engagement process that we have. All right, so we're right up against the hour right now. Um, and I wanna be respectful of people's time. I know we had um, uh, a closeout agenda item, Bruce. Yeah, D Dave, Mary did have her hand up and I think we missed it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm... Where's Mary? Here. There's Mary. My question is a really quick one. How can we be sure the extra dollars that we assign to education will go to schools and students and not end up sheer tax release relief? <laughs> I have to ask that. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Were you asking me? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's something that, that we're going to have to have to look at and um, and you know tie it into the fiscal policy that goes goes behind it. Rick, you had your hand up. No, I, I never took it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. In that case, um, I'll go ahead and pick up the the last item on the agenda here. Simply our schedule going forward, and also who else we want to hear from as a full commission. And which of our um, resource folks within the state, within state agencies, within uh, other organizations like Reaching Higher, we want to have come to uh, our work groups. So I'll just simply say that I'll work with Dave, Mel, and Jay 
and um, others to nail that down. Right now, the anticipated sort of rhythm for our meetings um, after this adjustment this week, our work groups will meet on Thursday. The full commission will meet again next Monday, May 11th. And then we'll go every other week, work groups and full commission on Mondays. So Mondays, starting on May 18th, will be a full day of work group meetings, again, scattered across the course of the day so that anybody can participate in any one of those meetings from 10 to noon, noon um, uh, one to three and three to five. Um, we'll get all this out. I wanted to confirm this with uh, Dave and the exec team mm -hmm. before I sent it out to you. But really right now through June, we're looking at that pattern. So you might mark your calendars for full commission meetings every other week, um, beginning May uh, 11th. I'll come back to that in a second. And then work group meetings every other Monday, um, beginning May 18th. Now, of course, we run into Memorial Day on May 25th, and I'll be working with Dave and the exec team to see if we can just, just nudge that Monday, May 25th to Tuesday, May 26th, so we don't again lose our lose our pattern, lose our rhythm, lose our momentum here. But essentially, that's 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 the anticipated process now through June. Um, We'll hope that things might open up. We might even be able to be face-to-face uh, -face by some point, you know, later on in June or into the summer in any case. So that's, that's what we'll say. It looks like Jay has a question, comment. Uh, yeah, uh, two mm -hmm. things. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I think that when we were talking about student engagement, um, there are opportunity questions that students, I think, could answer for us. Uh, and I don't think we want to wait until September to get those. So I, I guess, Mel, something to, to tee up for us in a conversation is, you know, how do we, how do we get some, take advantage of, you know, a classroom or two uh, in, in Litchfield and uh, 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 Exeter or Brentwood, uh, you know, to, to uh, anyway, that, that's just a, you know, out there. Um, the other is uh, if we find that uh, uh, our work groups want to meet more frequently, what is there any latitude uh, because of the notifications of calendar, uh, any latitude of squeezing in another meeting in between a couple of those that, uh, dates that you just gave? And I just pose that so that uh, David, I know I've got input into into what that answer might mm -hmm. be, but but I I also uh, feel that uh, members of the commission should should have some sense that uh, you know they they feel like we're you know into a great conversation and we're two hours into it and uh, it needs to continue and we don't want to wait until the end of the month to, to get to it uh, that, that we have got some flexibility there. Sure, sure. So, um, not to prolong this meeting, but but uh, anybody has feedback, things they like, things they didn't like, things they'd like to see done differently. Please email them to uh, to you know thoughts to me and Bruce, um, uh, Jay and Mel as well. Um, uh, we, you know, Bruce alluded to this earlier. Uh, alluded to an executive team. That's sort of how we've been able to continuing to to be able to make some progress. Uh, without having, you know, uh, Bruce and I sort of just try to figure out everything ourselves. So, um, you don't so want that. what's that? You don't want that. You know no, no. That. And, and, and we certainly want to be respectful to, to the full commission, the, the right to, right to know and be able to access, uh, commission meetings, but, um, but we need to be able to, you know, um, move things along in between these meetings. What can we accomplish, and and uh, and uh, uh, what we need to have meetings to be able to do. So, um, but if you if you've got some thoughts on these, let us know. We have talked for a while about going to an every other week um, uh, commission uh, schedule. So I think we're coming to that uh, time right now, with the intervening week being the the work group week. Um, yes, Iris. Just since we weren't able to get live public comment, if you get any public comment by email, could you let us all know? 
Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, I think the idea is Jordan's going to collect it all and then and then send it to us. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah. Any other? Um, yeah, any yeah. other? Yeah. Thought? Dave, Rick? Dave, Dave, can you, uh, like you've done in the past, can you send us a, a document with the calendar of of dates coming up? I know I've got emails here from you saying on May fourth we're doing this seventh, eleventh, the eighteenth. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful to myself. Yep. All right. Great, great. I think Bruce just put one of those together. So we, Bruce, if you can send that out, that'd be great. Yeah, I just wanted to get your okay on that before. Yep, started. yep, fantastic. Um, so feedback always encouraged. And um, anything else for the good of the cause? I just want to remind everyone that they're also on the CARSI school funding website. There is a form that people can use as well. It's a Qualtrics form where people can provide public comments. So anyone listening in is welcome to use that form as well as the email. Hey, 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 yeah. While CARSI's on there, uh, with all our university kids, college kids home right now, could we get information, and they're doing remote learning, at least my Two college kids are. Um, would this be an opportune time for us to get the engagement information back from them by way of the web? We'll let the engagement group take that up. It's a good, good question, Rick. Oh, I think that is a conversation. Um, well, I'm interrupting Michelle here, but um, I think that is a conversation for Thursday, especially in terms of the student voice. And we have talked about alumni, you know, first year graduates. Yeah. Um, having that conversation. And so figuring out that timing um, and, and yeah, capitalizing on the fact that people are home um, and how to embed that in is, is mm -hmm. would be a good point of conversation for Thursday at the work group. Great. Dick? Yeah, just a quick uh, reference to what I think is now on the website for the School Funding Commission. The briefs that have been filed by the uh, plaintiffs in the lawsuit and uh, by the state, of course, a, a month or two ago, and by a uh, amicus group, mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, it's John Tobin representing a number of municipalities, including Nashua and Manchester, maybe. Yeah, um, and they're. I encourage you to read them. They're interesting reads, not hard to read. Well, say I. I'm a lawyer, um, but uh, I encourage you to look at them. And those are all posted on the Carsey website now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Great. So, uh, so we'll see everybody, or I'll, I'll see everybody on Thursday, and um, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll reconvene uh, the commission uh, again on Monday the 11th. So, until then. Take care, everybody. Great. Everybody take care. Thank you. Cheers.